Welcome back, guys, to episode 80 of the JPS podcast. And I am back with another round table discussion with my amigos, Dr. Dave McConey and Steve Hall. And in this episode, this is part two of our roundtable discussion. Part one is over on Dave's channel, the Brains for Gains channel on YouTube. And we talk about stress and taking breaks. So in part one, we discuss adjusting training to life stresses, neurological versus muscular adaptations, our training recommendations during holidays or vacations, nutrition recommendations during holidays and vacations. And in part two of this roundtable, we talk about diet advice during high stress periods, as well as the common characteristics and traits of our successful clients and those who succeed in fitness. So guys, I'm sure you will take a lot from this episode. It was very informative and a heap of fun as always. And I very much enjoy my discussions with these guys. Uh, we are on the same page with many things, which is fantastic. And we have some unique perspectives given our different backgrounds, which I think you'll find highly informative. So without further ado, Dave, Steve, and myself talking to you about diet advice during high stress periods and how to be successful in your fitness endeavors. Yeah, and um, like you said, generally, these are periods that should be de-stressing, you know, just like relaxing. Um, but going back to the, the stressful periods, if it's, you know, more of a chronic, I would say chronic like years, but let's say somebody's going through a really stressful period and they know it's coming up, you know, okay, I have finals coming up, um, I'm getting married, whatever is going on for like a month, they're going to be really stressed. Um, typically, in, in those periods, I will almost always go to like a maintenance phase um and i was going to say how do you guys change maybe even like nutrition or sleep if possible because a lot of times obviously if it is a stressful period it's stressful in part because they can't get a lot of sleep so it's hard to say okay sleep more to help out with the stress but nutritionally i just generally don't want people in a big deficit during that period um not only because it's going to stress them out more but because the results just aren't going to be as good um i'd have to find the study but there was one study showing something like just with a couple hours less sleep per night, the weight loss ended up like if they had eight hours of mm. sleep, it was something like I know which study you're talking about. Yeah, and and if they had, I think it was five or six hours a night, it was like fifty percent fat, fifty percent lean tissue. I mean, it was a, a very dramatic difference, um, and that's just a couple hours. I mean, there are people who go five six hours a night every night with sleep, mm. you know. So um, I know, I think. I think Steve, you just had Greg Potter on. Was that you recently? We did Steve. a few months ago. Yeah. Okay. Greg yeah, Terry. I know we, we've all talked to him, and um, and you know how important sleep can be. But if somebody tells me they're going to have a really stressful month, I, I almost would rather than just try to keep everything else the same until you get out of that period. And if you just have a really stressful life, that's just tough. You know, if you just got like all these kids and, and your whole life is stressful, you know, obviously maybe you need to rebalance like not do podcasts at three in the morning jacob but uh <laughs> but in general yeah if they're really that stressed out I'll, I'll probably just try to put them in a maintenance phase and, and give them more calories than i otherwise would mm. yeah uh the study that uh you're referring to was um yeah a 2010 study and they had um eight and a half and five and a half hours sleep and they lost pretty much it was like 2.9 um kilos and three kilos um, in the eight and a half hour group lost 2.9 and the five and a half hour group lost uh, three kilos um, in weight. Um, but the difference in fat mass was um, like the, um, yeah, 8.5 group lost uh, nearly uh, double the amount of fat mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think those suggestions, Dave, are brilliant. I think being at maintenance during that period of time makes absolute sense. Uh, a deficit is probably the worst thing you can do because if you can't train in a manner, if you can't train as productively as possible during a kind of stress, what well, it's a stressful period. You're not going to be able to have your best training. Recovery is not going to be as good. Performance won't be as good. You won't be able to give the best stimulus for muscle growth and therefore risking muscle loss. Um, so it's just a bad idea and also being in a deficit, especially if it's exams or a stressful time, you're not going to perform your best for that period either. Like your exam results could even be worse. Um, so you're kind of putting like 
gas on a fire or something. You're just making the situation a hell of a lot worse um, and not making it better. And then even people might say, oh, being in a surplus would be even less stressful. Um, and I think in some ways it could, but that's still like being in a surplus is still somewhat of a stress for the body. And again, you're just risking needless muscle, I mean, fat gain because you're mm -hmm. not doing your productive training. You're not recovering as well, even with the surplus, especially for people who are more advanced. Like if you're quite advanced, the best advice by far is definitely maintenance. If you're maybe novice or like, like that, maybe you could get away with either state, but yeah. I'd agree with you, like take the time and maintenance and things will go much, much better. Um, with sleep, it's huge. And I think even at maintenance, if you were having like less than six hours a night, I reckon that would still upset things. Um, I just really try and encourage people to respect sleep more because I think a lot of the time when people say, oh, I can only get, I don't know, six hours, five hours, I think they've kind of got something in their mind about that. And rather than they just haven't set up their day to give them that time, I think if they start doing that, they'll start respecting sleep more and then they'll prioritize it more in their day. Um, and that can help a lot because you can't really get around not getting sufficient sleep at night. You can try and make up for it through naps and things like this. But um, the literature is kind of supporting the fact that that helps, but it doesn't get you what you should get um, through proper sleeping through the night. All right, so we lost Jacob there. Thought we got rid of him, but he is back. So Dingo back, ate my Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, so to one question we were going to wrap up with is, I think after you've been doing this yourself for a while, but also training people, you kind of get a sense, uh, like a mentality that you see in clients who come to you or who people you've been working with. And not to say that you think somebody's going to fail, but there are certain characteristics you see in somebody who you can think like, wow, like they've got this, they're going to go far with this. Not, not even just genetically in terms of their physique, but just their mindset for it. You know, they're in this for the long haul versus man, like this is somebody who is going to drop off pretty quickly. Um, so the first question would be, what are the traits that you tend to see in people who are the most successful? And secondly, you know, obviously our job as a coach is to help everybody who comes to us if we can. Um, so for the people who maybe don't seem like they're in this for the long haul or seem like they're going to drop off, how do we help them as much as possible to try to make them somebody who is going to succeed? Who wants to kick off? Off you go, I can't Steve. See. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll try. Um, so, yeah, successful traits. It's You're completely right in that even working with people online, I can tell after maybe the first month of check-ins, kind of what type of person is this and what, how much they want to invest into it and um i think there's the people lie on a bit of a spectrum that like there's people all the way at one end where they're really not ticking many boxes um in terms of what they need to do to succeed each day and then there's people who are ticking every box and then even ticking things that you're like that almost some actions they're making is making them almost untick boxes because they're stressing over minutia um, and unfortunately that isn't the best port of call either because i feel and i've seen people burn out via that approach um, a bit hypochondriac in nature and we kind of see at least like the most successful athletes can switch on and then switch off you see them kind of i always look at the guys doing the olympic lifts in the olympics and then you see them perform the lift they kind of celebrate and then they're down like they just recover and it's just crazy to see mm -hmm. them be able to flick that switch almost or it's not, obviously not a switch um so i really like a middle ground so people who can be very serious and tick boxes but also know when they can turn off and when they can chill out because i feel like for the kind of purposes of physique development at least like consistency long term is the most important so i find that when people can be in that middle zone uh, that can provide sustainability and they can move forward in the long term and i think at times there's people who push more towards one end than the other in terms of like flexibility and stressing about the details versus chilling out so it might be that on holidays they're like virtually off but then when they're in contest prep, they're like all the way on and just moving between these two. I think people who can successfully move between them tend to be the most successful um, because they're super consistent and they can keep it sustainable. In terms of trying to get someone towards that, it's just encouraging them like via opposite means almost. Um, so the per people who aren't really nailing things, it's kind of like, well, what's your, what's your low hanging fruit? What can we do that you can just automatically change that habit into a positive habit um, doing the kind of easy big wins for them and then the people who can't switch off is kind of like what Jacob said there making them understand the whys behind things really helps because sometimes the whys then satisfy you to realize that you can't 
kind of optimized. Some things can't be optimized. Um, some things you can't nail it 100% because it's just impossible. And the fact you can never know what is or isn't optimal. And de-stressing is often like a really good, important thing. Um, kind of that work harder, harder is better crowd. Try and encourage them to kind of switch off. And mostly for, for my guys that end up doing that, it's just educating them. And experience helps tons. Um, the more they experience that, the more they trust the process. They get comfortable with it. And they end up getting towards a more balanced kind of person. So, yeah, that's what I guess how I would see things. Yeah, and I'm glad that you brought up how even, you know, we were kind of talking there, kind of seemed like we were going towards saying to people who aren't dedicated. But you're right, if you're almost like too dedicated, there is that risk of burnout. And, you know, something that I focus on my channel a lot is saying how, you know, to have a, a better mindset with this, to have a better relationship with it. And it's not just because, like, I think if you watch the videos, you might just think because I'm saying it's not as important or something. And it's not even just that. It's just that even if you find this extremely important, even if this is like the number one thing in your life, for most people, you still can burn out if you're putting everything into it. I mean, and thankfully, I am particularly stubborn. But looking back at how I was like in, in high school, it's like I'm, I'm almost surprised I didn't burn out. You know, I mean, I was getting maybe average results, but I was putting everything into it. And it, it's just it is a problem if you're that obsessed. Um, I've noticed this with several uh, female clients I've had where if they, you know, they, they get really excited, uh, they start going on Instagram and now they're like, oh, I want to be like that. And they get everything into it. You know, they're really motivated and that's awesome. But then if they feel, wow, I put in so much and it's been one year and I don't look like that yet and they just get burnt out or um, you guys might have people who have done competitions and after the competition, now they're almost like spiteful towards the sport because they're like, wow, like I developed such a bad relationship with food. Um, obviously, you know, eating disorders are, are very prevalent, even more so in women. Um, but I, I've even had male clients who have done like physique competitions and they just feel awful afterwards. You know, they say they come to me saying like, well, I, I looked good, but they're just now they're like 20 pounds heavier or 20 pounds heavier than when they started the whole process. Um, so I've seen a lot of people who were really motivated and it seemed great really spiral down quickly um if that's not checked i can right. i'll just button very quickly before yeah. i can't see jacob so i can't assess <laughs> right, right. whether he wants to speak <laughs> um but something i just wanted to pick on really quickly there was um also successful clients fall in love with the process mm. so it's a case of mm. like not focusing on the outcome all the time and are we there yet it's a case of i really enjoy my training and i really enjoy this new lifestyle i've got to eating those are the true successful people because it's a long pursuit. Yeah. It's not a short one. You can't kind of just build up and run a marathon at the end of the year. If you want to compete and be good, you need years and years of investment. So you've got to love it. Right. It's not about willpower. You know, it's yeah. just about lifestyle. Mm. Yeah. No, I uh, definitely agree with uh, a lot of what you guys said. And I think, um, yeah, you guys might be familiar with uh, self-determination theory. Um which you know is a concept, um, you know, surrounding itself upon um, you know core tenets of success and you know behavior modification. Um, those being uh, competency, autonomy, and relatedness. And I think uh, I always keep these three things in the back of my mind when working with people because I've definitely not only you know I've read about this uh, this theory, but also uh, seen it in practice, um, you know, the individuals who become competent themselves, as I was explaining earlier, um, you know, they develop skills and the knowledge to be able to problem solve on their own. Um, that's the competency component. They're the ones who generally achieve the world of success uh, in physique and strength sports um, because, you know, many times the coach can't be there, especially uh, the nutrition side of things. Um, you know, there's only so much we can do uh, in a given training session or in Steve's case, uh, weekly update online. Um, you know, the other hours of the day uh, where you're putting food down your gullet uh, play a big role in body composition, all those sorts of things. Uh, so I think uh, competency is a big one. Um, key trait of the successful clients I've had is that they've learned how to um, apply everything that I'm teaching them on their own and they can uh, do that quite well. Uh, the th second one is autonomous. So uh, ties into competency quite a lot because uh, as you develop more skills and knowledge, um, you become less reliant on other people. And I think uh, autonomy, um, you know, being our own free agent is something that we all want. 
um, you know, deep down, we, we don't want to depend on other people, or in many cases, uh, we don't anyway. Um, so I think, you know, giving autonomy to the clients over time, um, as we discussed with the beginners and the advanced with their flexibility in program design, um, you know, that autonomy, taking control of the process a little bit um, as the athlete or client uh, evolves through their training career um, has been a big key in uh, those of clients of mine who have been successful, giving them more control and input in the coaching process. So it becomes more a conversation than, uh, you know, a, a dictatorship, uh, so to speak. And then the third one is relatedness. So having that feeling of connection um, to other like-minded individuals and feeling like you're a part of the community. From a biological perspective, this is one of our, you know, uh, biological problems that we had to solve. You know, it was very different, uh, you know, millions of years ago uh, when, you know, we were trying to build coalitions and form a tribe so that we could, um, you know, hunt and gather more efficiently and protect ourselves so that we could solve other biological problems such as find mate, retain mate, pass on genetic material, avoid poisonous food and, you know, find nutritious food, avoid predators and all those sorts of things. The tribe definitely helped there. But now that tribe gives us, um, you know, a sense of connection and a group to identify with um, and that's very important uh, for people. So I think those three things are paramount uh, for, you know, my, my clients who are, you know, hoping to be successful in the physique and strength game. And then uh, I think there's some other, you know, really key traits. Um, you know, I read a book um, by Richard St. John, uh, Eight to be Great, um, which was, uh, yeah, a book where he researched over the course, I think it was like 10 years, um, and interviewed like 500 extraordinary um, successful people in many, many fields, um, trying to find out what helped them succeed. He analyzed, sorted out, and correlated all the you know millions of you know research and whatnot that he'd done, um, and he came up with this like database on the subject of success, which was really cool. Um, and some of those traits uh, were passion. Um, so you know, as Steve mentioned, you know, people need to fall in love with the process. Um, and not the outcomes. And that comes down to, you know, um, the skills and competencies because if someone's competent in something, they realize that um, the outcome is dictated on the process. So they fall in love with the process, not the outcomes. Um, and some of the other traits that uh, he mentioned uh, of being uh, correlated with highly successful people were, you know, work ethic, um, you know, the ability to focus on a task, um, to push themselves and, you know, go outside their comfort zone. Um, and, and the ones that are, spe- these, these are the ones that are specific in a, a training and coaching context. Um, it was also the desire to improve. Uh, and then uh, there were some other ones, but the, the pertinent ones to this conversation are, you know, finally persist. So, you know, being able to pick yourself up and dust yourself off after a setback um, and developing some emotional resilience. And I definitely think um, that's really important in, um, you know, what we do um, in the physique and strength game um, because you will miss lifts. You will have shit days in the gym. You may not place as highly as what you think you deserved in a bodybuilding competition and you won't always look your best. Um, you know, for whatever reason, as life changes, uh, your training and your body composition will likely take a back seat at certain points in time, um, which can be frustrating. Um, you know, it can be demotivating and all those sorts of things and you need to you know, have the behaviors implemented and the structures and systems, um, you know, in place so that you can uh, persist despite, you know, changing circumstances, uh, priorities, and, you know, any kind of uh, hardships that you experience along the way. So, uh, yeah, they're my thoughts on that. Good stuff, man. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think all that, I pretty much agree with all that. I think it is interesting that I think most of the people who we talk to on these podcasts would also agree that your mindset after 10 years, it's just so different than when you got into it, right? Of course, mm-hmm. I think a lot of us did get into it either to just like superficial reasons and not that it's not superficial now. I mean, obviously trying to make your body look as good as possible is inherently superficial. Um, but I think all of us have kind of got to a point where we are in it for the process and it's much harder to imagine not having it in our life. Whereas, you know, I think most people do get started where, wow, like that looks cool. I do want to have bigger arms. I do want to like have this thing. I want to get compliments, whatever. Um, and that almost always dies out with the people who, who stick with this. You know, I don't know anybody who's been doing it for 10 to 15 years who still has that same mentality as when they got into it, who, you know, maybe they watch a movie and there's like a jacked actor or something like that. Um, that almost always changes. And if it doesn't change, usually they don't stick with it very long. Yeah, totally. I think uh, 
what you value in uh, the iron game or physical culture should evolve along with uh, your strength and physique. You should no longer seek uh, the same things uh, through training and diet um, as what you did when you first got into it. Because I think everybody gets into lifting, um, you know, to improve their aesthetics or to solve a certain problem that they're facing. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading and research um, on evolution and biology of late. Um, and yeah, it's like, what is the functional advantage that we obtain through lifting weights? Generally, it's improving our health, um, our cosmetics and our aesthetics to, uh, you know, attain some form of, you know, functional advantage um, from a biological perspective because everything we do is, you know, driven from um, our biology. And in this case, you know, the problems that we can solve through lifting weights are, you know, we want to be more attractive to pick up girls, right? We want to be bigger, you know, more muscular because that's a sign of masculinity and, hey, we think that that's what women want. Uh, you know, women do the same. They think that if they, you know, lose some fat, have that hourglass figure, the 0.68 to 0.72 waist hip ratio uh, that has been proven to be a very functionally advantageous, uh, you know, waist hip ratio for women from a biological perspective. Uh, they've even had congenitally, congenitally blind men uh, do a field test. So men who have never seen the light of day feel a woman with a 0.68 to 0.72 waist hip ratio and then a woman who's straight up and down and these men always have a preference for the hourglass figure. Um, you know, so, so we get into weights to you know, solve those problems, but um, I think what a lot of people soon realize is that, as you mentioned, it's quite a superficial problem um, to want to solve, and it's one that doesn't necessarily um, you know, become eradicated um, once we start lifting weights and do change our physiques. Um, you know, and there's a lot of other uh, things that lifting weights um, can help us with. And a lot of the skills and lessons that we develop along the way, such as, uh, you know, the traits I mentioned, like, um, you know, dedication, discipline, desire, 3DMJ, um, all of those sorts of things are transferable to other aspects of life. Um, you know, so I think, uh, yeah, we get into weight lifting weights generally um, for a very surface level reason. Um, very cosmetic orientated or health orientated in, in some cases. And if that's the case, then that's kind of uh, far more important than uh, the cosmetic side of things. Um, but nonetheless, it, it should evolve over time. We should uh, hopefully start to lift weights uh, because it gives us a sense of uh, you know purpose and satisfaction and we enjoy um, everything else that comes with lifting weights, such as the ability to delay gratification um, you know, being able to set a goal and, you know, work towards that, having the patience to do so, uh, committing to that, you know, goal and that process and all those sorts of things. And uh, like I teach all my bodybuilders, um, you know, when you get on stage, um, be proud of the physique that you present, but also be more proud of everything that you had to do to get it um, because they are the true uh, benefits of bodybuilding, not the physique that you get, um, but the person that you uh have to be to get there. Um, and I think that when we take, uh, you know, perspective of training um, through that lens, um, you know, the, the benefits all of a sudden become far more um, important and at, at, at a much deeper level beneficial to, you know, us as human beings. Sure, sure. Any uh, final thoughts, Steve? Uh, no, I just, I don't know where Jacob pulls this from, remembering the exact figure of the, the ratios. <laughs> I feel like you've had these written down on your hand since you were a teenage boy and you've just been Steve searching. asked me, <laughs> Steve, Steve asked me when, um, man, my laptop just died. I couldn't have any of these notes anyway. Um, Steve asked me when I went on his podcast once, um, once and only time I've been on and I'll probably never be on again. And I don't take offense to that because I abuse He's outgrown us. Steve. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, he said at the end of the podcast, did you, did you read all that from notes? And I'm like, no, man, I've just got my email sitting up here in the background. I'm convinced. Uh, I, I have, um, <laughs> I have pretty good recall. And if I'm interested in something, then it kind of, if I read it, it sticks. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I, I can only agree. Um, I can only agree. I think your perspective changes if you're in this for a long term. 
your perspective changes to what you get from it rather than kind of necessarily the kind of outcome of it. Mm. And I guess um, it kind of has to, right? Like, because if you don't, you'll hate it. <laughs> you right, know, because it's slow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of forced, it, but it's true. It's forced upon you. Like, mm-hmm. you know, shit, if I was as gung-ho as I was, you know, when I first started and, you know, every session was, you know, taking as much pre-workout as I could, getting as hyped up as possible and, you know, just do or die attitude every single workout, holy crap, that's draining. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't sustain that. Um, and not only that, it's super you know, unpleasant um, to do that and get very marginal returns on such a, you know, uh, costly investment. So you have to, you have to learn to appreciate other things um, when you're lifting, because if you don't, you will burn out because uh, yeah, it's just not fun to, you know, put all that effort and time in, um, you know, emotionally and, you know, mentally more so than physically, um, you know, every single day, um, you know, hoping for, you know, change and checking your abs every day or, you know, looking at your biceps or quads in Steve's case, have they grown? Steve, to answer that question, no, they haven't. You've still got smaller quads than me. Um, but, yeah, I think if if you don't slow down um, and extract yourself from the, you know, the grind, so to speak, and recognize that, hey, this is going to take some time and years to, uh, you know, get to where I want to be, um, I should probably learn to enjoy things other than the end product. Um, you, yeah, you're not going to be in it for a long time. Absolutely. All right, guys. So, Steve Hall, where can we find you? Um, so, yeah, revivestronger.com, probably best place you can find the podcast. Or in the gym. And, or in the gym. No, I've, the day. Uh, that's start, well, no, I'm not sure when that will start kicking back in. I'm looking to periodize my way back into that because – going straight into twice a day, six times a week from going from five once a day. Yeah. Anyway, so revivestronger.com, revive stronger on any platform. You should be able to find us. Uh, it'd be awesome to interact. Sure. Jacob, where can we find you? In Australia, mate. <laughs> Hiding behind a couple of dingoes. No, <laughs> um, so dingoes ain't my wife either, motherfuckers. So I've got to go chase them later. Um, JPS, Health and Fitness on Facebook. Instagram, YouTube, our website. Yeah, that's, uh, right. that's where we're at, man. Thank oh, you very cool. much for having us. I apologize again for uh, my laptop deciding to restart. I did forget that I scheduled the restart, um, <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> no worries. All right, guys, perfect. good talk as always.